Welcome everyone to our very first expert talk from Green Building Solutions. Uh, we're really happy to have a lot of you here. Uh, I see in the moderation panel right now that a lot of people have asked to share uh, their audio and video. Uh, however, uh, this is not um, the traditional Zoom call, so to say, so you won't have to appear or see everyone uh, on the screen at all time. Um, we will, however, give you the chance to come online on camera uh, later during the Q&A session. So we're happy to, to have you there uh, later. So don't worry. Uh, I see all of you trying to join uh, with video, but uh, it's, it's a different experience this time around. Um, well, my name is Dominique Bourret, so I'm organizing with the UAD uh, Student Housing uh, this very first expert talk with you guys. Really excited, actually. Uh, the response has been amazing. A lot of people joining. And this is just the first talk of a series of talk that we plan on doing uh, with our partners and so on. So if you are one of those partners or interested in hosting such an event with us, we'd of course be interested uh, to have you. Um, in general, uh, I spoke about the platform already. Uh, today, uh, in terms of schedule, we're going to have, uh, after this short intro uh, from our organization, we're going to have um, the inputs from our experts and uh, afterwards a Q&A where uh, the contact with the audience uh, will will be uh, the best. Um, I would encourage you, and actually I already have a favor to ask. Um, that's how it is. Uh, this is, an online event like this is nothing uh, without the audience, without you. So I would like to activate you already, uh, right from the start. If you can see, actually, uh, we have the chat here. Uh, so you should be in the sessions, right? Everything is deactivated. If you go on the panel on the right, you have events, but you should be in session. So this is where everything will happen today. Uh, so you already made it here, so it's great. Uh, so you have a tab here, which is called Slido. So in Slido, you can um, actually ask your questions during the talk. So we've been collecting those questions already before the event. So they are already there. And you can ask during the talk, upvote the questions, uh, classic uh, Q&A uh, interaction. And the favor I have to ask right away is a poll. So always good to know uh, where people are coming from actually joining the talk. So I'm really curious uh, where everybody is joining from. So I would like you to go in Slido. So you have uh, here polls and I'm starting the poll now. So if you can just type in where you are joining from today, uh, that would be great. And we can see this appear actually, Vienna. Okay, nice. Uh-huh. A big European representation, Canada, yeah. Mm -hmm. Denmark coming, yes. We're supposed to, so I, from what I've heard and from what I've seen actually people joining, we're supposed to cover the five continents um, today. So um, I actually really like the diversity of what we're seeing. Obviously, we're based in Vienna, so Vienna comes uh, very strong here. And uh, yes, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to see where you are right now already. And you know where the Q&A uh, is uh, afterwards to be able to continue uh, the discussion and ask your questions during the talk. And as I said, we will come back in the end. Uh, by the way, um, you will have to stay until the end because uh, I have a surprise for you in the end. I'll be happy if you um, stay with us. And I will like to invite Barbara Maya uh, to uh, tell us more about EAD 
and the summer universities actually, which are the motivation for, for these talks as well. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you, Dominic, for this nice introduction. Um, so welcome everyone to this very first expert talk of the Green Building Solutions. Uh, I shortly would like to introduce to you the OED, OEAD uh, student housing and the two summer schools that we are offer, which are Green Building Solutions and the Alternative Economic and Monetary Systems. So um, I'm working for the student housing already since six years uh, where I'm organizing this uh, summer school. So the OED student housing um, accommodates students all over Austria in energy efficient student dorms. Uh, we are a non-profit organization and we are a pioneer in uh, passive house uh, planning and building in Austria. More than 60% of our dorms are built in passive house standard and they are in eight uh, student cities in Austria. Um, as there is no time for details at the moment, I would like to provide you afterwards the links to our energy efficient student dorms uh, where you can have a look at them and all the innovative buildings that we are um, offering. Um, Dominic already mentioned that Green Building Solution Summer University is the host today. So the um, summer school was initiated by Magister Günther Jedlitschka uh, to pass on our knowledge and, and um, know-how on sustainable construction di directly to students and professionals. Therefore, he um, initiated two summer schools. Actually, it's um, the Green Building Solutions and the second one is the Alternative Economic and Monetary Systems. Um, both summer schools start with the topic climate change and uh, specialize then once in the uh, ecolog ecological construction uh, field and the other in the alternative economic and financial systems. Um, for the summer universities, we collaborate with um, over 60 university partners and uh, mainly, of course, with the BOKU in Vienna and the TU Wien. Uh, the BOKU also uh, credits the summer schools, one with uh, seven ECTS and the other with five. In 2020, we uh, had those summer schools for the first time online, which we also plan for this year as it will not be possible to, um, to install them in Vienna. Um, so we are looking forward to uh, welcome you for our online summer universities this year again. That's it actually from my side. Thank you for joining today. And I pass now on to Doris Österreicher from BOKU, who introduces to you the topic and the speakers that we have today. Thank you. Yes. Hello also from my Österreich. Thank you for the introduction. I will be your moderator for today. So I will lead you through the sessions and also then moderate in the end the panel discussion. So without further ado, we have today a very interesting topic, um, energy positive uh, neighborhoods and districts. And I think that's a very um, pertinent topic at the moment, because if we're talking about renewable energy, we also need uh, to talk about at the same time about storage and buildings, districts and cities can provide ample storage for load shifting and for energy generation in general. So I think this is a topic that's very pressing at the moment. And also the EU has um, actually suggested that they will build uh, 100, up to 100 um, energy positive districts by 2025. So that's very soon. So even more so, this topic is very pressing. So I would like to introduce um, our first speaker for today, Simon Schneider. He's from FH Technico Wien, and he will introduce himself a little bit. And I will speak to you again after the first session. Simon, please share the floor. Um, hello. Can you hear me? I'm not sure if uh, my microphone is working, but I think... Yes, we hear perfectly, Simon. Thank you. Okay, great. 
and the screen is also working. Okay, so yeah, thank you, Doris, for the introduction, and also uh, thank you very much, Dominic and the GBS team, for um, organizing this event and making it possible for us to have this time and space, even though virtual, uh, to talk about positive energy districts and how they are connected to our climate goals. Um, my name is Simon Schneider. Um, I'm a physicist and an energy engineer, and I have been studying positive energy buildings and positive energy districts um, for the better part of seven years now. Um, and I'm currently at the University of Applied Sciences um, in the research group of renewable energy systems and sustainable buildings and cities, where I try to incorporate and distill the research results that uh, we have from the last couple of years on positive energy districts now into our study programs, into our curriculum on urban renewable energy technology, urban renewable energy systems. So, um, yeah, I want to start with um, maybe you've seen this um, cartoon kind of thing here. Um, now in the COVID crisis, um, it's all about flattening the incidence curve. And I thought this was very um, head on. We need to also flatten this global temperature exponential curve, right? And I, as, if you're like me, this is why, or I presume a lot of people are here today because um, it, we are actually trying to solve a very complicated problem of how to flatten this exponential curve. So this is why we're talking about positive energy districts and the building sector in general, because as you probably know, the um, energy required to operate the buildings worldwide is around 40% of all the energy um, used. And in terms of emissions, uh, a third of the emissions um, can be associated with building operation and is, is produced by, by buildings. So um, I asked Dominic to maybe put another Slido here um, because I was very interested to see the actual emissions per person per capita in your countries because I understood that this is a very international um, audience. Um, but I just put the slide here for the situation in Austria where currently we have 12 tons of CO2 per person and year. And if we want to take our climate um, goals of Paris uh, 2015 seriously, then we need to go down to one. So buildings and the location of buildings can be associated with the third on the left here. And this is not just building operation of the heating, cooling, etc. But this is also, of course, embodied emissions of construction materials, right? Every um, ton of cement produces a ton of CO2. Uh, on the other hand, every ton of wood uh, in construction takes one ton of CO2 out of the atmosphere for 100 years. So there's big differences, especially when we talk about uh, increasing technology utilization that also needs to be produced and is very intensive, um, both in terms of energy and emissions to produce those. Um, so we need to take those emissions into account, also the electricity of the users. And what we also want to do is include the mobility emissions at the buildings and the location sites, not because they're responsible, but because they can have some measures and some mitigating effects to increase the um, uh, utilization of other modes of transport that are less carbon intensive. So overall, a third of emissions um, that are attributed in some way or another with the buildings. And that is where we need to focus on and try to um, take some away. So when we come when it comes to positive energy districts, what what what, it, what we're actually talking about here, the basic principle of a positive energy district or a positive energy neighborhood is actually very simple. It's so simple that it's actually naive. It is the idea that you have an annual balance of your energy demand on one side and the renewable energy supply that you can provide on site on the other hand. And if this Ellen annual balance is equal or a little in favor of the renewables, then you can call it a positive energy district. Now, the problem, because, uh, the problem with this definition starts when you ask which kinds of energy demands you want to include in this balance. And 
Historically, this was just the HVAC components of the buildings, heating, cooling, domestic hot water, ventilation, trying to supply as much of these energy demands renewably on site. Now, the unofficial definition that we have today, um, I say unofficial because there is no official definitions for a couple of reasons, but um, that's why I uh, highlighted in orange this area that also includes the user services and plug loads. That's the current ambitious goal to have those demands met with renewable energies on site. Now, there is a big argument that you could make that actually you should also include embodied energy um, of the technology that you need. For example, solar power panels are not cheap. Um, also, other uh, technologies, they need energy and emissions um, to be produced and utilized. So should you also include that into the balance? That is a question of debate. And also, how much of the day-to-day -day mobility emissions should you include into this district energy balance? Because the same district, if it is in a remote location, will naturally have higher emissions just by their location um, in contrast to a more um, urban um, location of a district. Um, so there is various definitions uh, and various system boundaries of varying ambitions, I should say. And also note that positive energy districts are actually not energy autonomous they still require grid interaction. They only have an annual balance that is equal. That doesn't mean that they don't have times throughout the years where they need energy, especially electricity or district heating from the grid. And there's other times where they actually supply to the grid. And this is um, becoming more and more important as we try to decarbonize our whole energy system in total. Um, but nevertheless, this is the sort of naive uh, definition of what a positive energy district is, positive annual energy balance. Now, if you um, go further down into this um, line of thinking um, and investigate, as we do in our research right now, how can you actually have target values that are sensible and make sense in different um, for different districts of different possibilities? Um, you run into all kinds of different problems, and I don't have much time to um, explain further on this topic, but just one example I want to give is the density. Um, this naive definition of a positive energy district heavily favors districts that have very little usable floor area, because there it's trivial to get all the required energy on site. Um, so if we, the goal is actually to push legislation and regulation to have a certifiable target value of a positive energy district, then these um, issues of definitions and methodology become important. But if you're interested in this, um, we, I, I put the link here if, uh, for further reading. But um, apart from, from the more methodological scientific side of these definitions, um, Positive energy districts are actually, as Doris already said in the introduction, a topic that has been getting steam and momentum throughout the last couple of years on the political side of things. It's not so much a scientific thing now, but rather a vehicle, a, a storytelling device for um, municipalities and, and politics to push districts into a more sustainable uh, direction, into being more energy efficient, in, in be having higher performance and lower emissions. So this is why we see all kinds of positive energy districts all around Europe. And uh, to cut a long story short, there is, in my opinion, no actual positive energy district in operation right now. There is one or two that you could argue they incorporate some. And there is many, pro pos uh, many projects that incorporate some aspects of positive energy districts, but not on a holistic scale. Nevertheless, in, uh, Doris already said, by 2025, we have to have 100 positive energy districts underway in Europe, and there's a lot of funding and research activities accompanying that right now. Now, um, yeah, one example, I don't want to linger on these examples because I think Günther Lang will uh, have a very detailed um, description of the actual district here in Vienna, but this may be one of the more interesting examples that is already realized in Nantes in France. But of all these positive energy district projects that already are underway in Austria, uh, not in Austria, also in Austria, but also in Europe, 
if you look at the goals and the ambitions, positive energy balance is just one of many goals and it's not the main goal and rightfully so. The actual goals um, obviously are um, having a neighborhood that has a very high quality of life, high thermal comfort for the inhabitants, good affordability, um, climate neutrality, um, things like circular economies, reducing the um, resource um, intensity, reducing waste, etc. And those are the actual societally relevant goals. Positive energy is just a middle, it's just a stepping stone towards this that can enable this, but it's not a goal in of itself. And you see that reflected here in the goals of these projects. Um, so there is a lot of different areas of activities and focus apart from local renewables and the buildings themselves. Um, so the actual um, definition that is currently being used is not so much a definition of having a positive energy balance, but rather having neighborhoods and district projects that push the boundaries of what is possible in these three key areas. Those, this is now the, you know, this is the official definition of a PET uh, on a qualitative level. So you have the three pillars of energy efficiency, increasing utilization of local renewables and energy flexibility. Now, energy efficiency is nothing new and this uh, is ongoing development for the last decades. The passive house being the most prominent example of pushing energy efficiency to a whole new level and all the positive energy districts nowadays are barely possible without having energy efficiency as the base requirement of their operation. So they are the, the basic requirement, obviously they're important, but this is well understood and technology is very mature. And on the side of utilization of local renewables, it's similar that technology like solar thermal, solar power um, photovoltaics um, have been around for decades and they've become increasingly um, affordable. And the combination with heat pumps and ambient heat, be it from ground, water or air, um, they are a very efficient way of um, supplying renewable energy to the districts. And now the push is even further to also include other forms of um, uh, ambient heat from waste heat, for, for, from cooling, for example, from supermarkets, from server farms, even sewage water and, and the likes can be utilized here. But still, the technologies are very mature and it's more a question of combining them together into a um, smart system rather than having to develop anything new. Now, the big important new aspects the positive energy districts bring to the table today is this third part of energy flexibility. Doris already mentioned that in, in, in your introduction for our carbonization a decarbonization strategy, we need storage of energy and being flexible um, to um, de decide when we want to use, when is the best um, time to use energy. And for that, we have different options. We can use different types of thermal storages, different types of electric storages, demand side management, also one way of increasing flexibility. But the biggest part or one of the, the key aspects here is also the flexibility of the user, because ultimately the user um, of these districts and neighborhoods um, decides when he or she will use or want to use energy. So they themselves need to be flexible um, to uh, when they are okay with not using energy. And this is one of, one of the key challenges um, to get the users on board and make them, not make them, but um, have them understand and also um, work together with the building uh, to optimize this flexibility potential and not work against it. There is a lot of uh, examples from passive houses, early passive houses, where there was no um, window ventilation required anymore because you had a very efficient mechanical ventilation and the people didn't know, they thought they wanted to if they wanted fresh air, they needed to open the windows and that uh, destroyed basically the operation system of, the, of these houses. And it's similar with these concepts for positive energy districts. So energy flexibility is the big new thing and how um, can this be achieved on different levels? Districts have a couple of options that I wanna show you on um, this next slide here. 
oh the the one slide below yeah this is just um to remind you um why this flexibility is so important uh, in austria our goal is to be 100% um energy uh, the 100% of the energy should be renewable by 2040 and that means increasing our wind power by a factor of 5 and increasing our photovoltaic solar power by a factor of 20 um so the times when the renewables will be available will be very volatile. They shift from uh, depending on the weather. And you can see this already today. Um, I pulled this from yesterday from Lower Austria Energy Monitoring Utility. You see here these wind peaks in light blue, they already in winter exceed at sometimes the demand of the grid. Now, in the worst case, if we cannot export or store these um, renewable wind peaks, well, the energy is lost. And on the other hand, we have these white areas under the demand curve where there's not enough energy um, in terms of wind and solar available. So the basic, more important than a positive energy balance over the course of a year, that just takes the average of all of this, is it to actually fill the gaps. So change the red demand curve so that it actually fits better the renewable curve that we are getting from, from our grid. And this doesn't matter whether it's on-site renewables or off-site renewables. The difference between on-site and off-site is just that if you have it on-site renewables, you have actually an economic, a big economic incentive to use your own renewables as efficiently as possible. Um, but uh, for the electricity system in total, this still holds true if we want to decarbonize the system in, in general. So the options that districts have here uh, are the following. And I couldn't resist... Um, putting this very busy slide here um, so please bear with me but basically what you see on the left here is the thermal storage in action in a district and it all is being possible because of the user flexibility the user allows the indoor temperature to fluctuate between 22 degrees as a baseline and 25 degrees as a maximum so you already see the more you the user is flexible in certain areas the more flexibility potentials are possible. So here, um, if you have, and this is the requirement, a very good thermal hull and a high thermal mass of the building that you can heat directly by floor heating to some degree or even better, concrete core activation. Just put the plastic tubes inside the concrete core. You activate the thermal mass itself you need very low temperatures compared to radiation heating or, or ventilation heating of 25 to 35 degrees. So that's why it's so efficient because you can supply that with heat pumps with just a fraction, like a fifth of the um, supplied heat or reduced heat uh, you, you need in, in terms of uh, electricity. Now the ambient heat for that you can get from the boreholes, from the ground, from brine, from, from groundwater, from ambient heat, uh, from ambient air waste heat from industrial processes, etc. But if you have this very um, good thermal hull with a high thermal mass, then the time it uh, takes for the building to cool out is actually a couple of days. And this is what you see in the middle. Now, in times where there is a lot of renewables on the grid available or locally available, you pump all of this, you use all of these renewables and, and, and charge your storages, your thermal storage, um, but could also be um, decentralized uh, domestic hot water tanks where you can store this energy. And then you have a lot of times where you can uh, deal without any having, having any renewables. So that's the basic principle. And, and the um, good thing about having an electric uh, system like this with heat pumps is that you're that you can do this modularly. You can include all different kinds of um, heat sources. You can include different kinds of electricity sources, and you can even um, include mobility. And this is also where we were going back to the definition side of things. If we also include the mobility to, to be covered, then it's much more efficient to pool the electric cars together in the whole district. We only need a couple of cars being charged top um, for the immediate demand and the rest we can uh, shift around and actually use as a, a electric storage as well. Um, domestic hot water tanks are another, yeah, there's a couple of possibilities. Um, and the important thing here is that this is not only possible for newly built buildings, which only will be 20% of the buildings being built, uh, being standing around 2050, right? But this is also with floor heating 
And and boreholes, this is also possible to retrofit for um, existing buildings. And this is actually what, what is necessary because if we have these inc increased volatile um, renewables that we need to decarbonize our energy system, then this flexibility has to come somewhere. And if we don't want to mine all the lithium out of the ground um, to build expensive batteries, I mean, that's, that's not possible anyway. So that's one, one, one um, possibility. So um, my last slide, um, since energy flexibility is actually the main point I wanted to stress with the positive energy districts, I just wanted to give you an example of our um, positive energy district that we're currently um, developing in Vienna. It's just three small, relatively small buildings. Um, but uh, there, uh, this I think highlights very well another very important aspect of positive energy districts, which is that you actually need to incorporate these energy aspects of renewable on-site generation from the very beginning of the planning process. We started doing PV models of these sites before the architects were even on board um, for the last two or three years, I think two years. So now we were able to fit all of these solar panels on these three buildings because we were interactively and planning together with the architects to increase the um, potential of the design in this way. And now we have uh, five times as much um, panels installed here as the city of Vienna legally requires us to have. So also on the side of renewable integration on site, there's of course a lot possible if you start uh, integrating that in the planning process early enough. Thank you for your attention. I think that's that's my 20 minutes. I'm trying to be uh, on time and I'm looking forward to the discussion and the uh, uh, questions. Okay. Thank you very much. And also thank you very much for keeping to time. It's very precise. I think uh, Simon already put the transition in for the next um, presentation that we have from Günther Lang. And I think um, we hear a lot about new energy positive districts, but of course, we also want to talk about existing buildings and how we transform existing buildings into positive energy buildings and positive energy districts. And now I would like to introduce to you our second speaker for today, Günther Lang, who will make a presentation on the Otto Wagner Areal. Günther, the floor is yours. If you have any questions, please put them in uh, Slido and uh, we will discuss them afterwards in our panel discussion. So I take note of the question. I think it's great that you're already posting so much um, and we will wrap them up then at the end in the panel discussion. Günther, welcome and the floor is yours. Oh, Günther has left the building. So um, I hope he's coming back. Let's see, I'll stick around until he gets back onto the floor. He was just here, but um, he was obviously um, being kicked out again. Oh, here he is. So thank you very much, Günther. Floor is yours. Yeah. yeah. Okay, hello everybody. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So sorry. Uh, welcome everybody worldwide. Uh, we will start in uh, one second. Um, I think you, everyone, know around the world uh, the problems. Uh, when you will discuss about uh, energy efficient buildings or plus energy buildings, uh, that it's too complicated, that it's not possible, that it's not economic. Uh, by new buildings, by retrofits from the 60s, we want to show you today that it's also possible by historic buildings. Um, and therefore, I will welcome you everyone uh, by this hopeful happy hour. Uh, how the Americans make it each week. Uh, we want to retrofit in Vienna this Otto Wagner area to a net zero campus uh, where we have the vision to turn this historic uh, Otto Wagner area in the world's first plus energy district. While meeting the requirements of listed building, the monumental area will be conserved. Uh, 
for Austria, for Vienna, for the city of Vienna, and for the Central European University, this set an important international milestone on the way to a climate neutral neutrality. Uh, for all of that, which are not from Austria or Vienna, I will show on this map where this area will be. On the left side, you see uh, eight kilometers west from the city center, uh, this huge area named Steinhof with the Otto Wagner area uh, is as large as two districts in Vienna, as the seventh and eighth district, uh, and only the Otto Wagner area. Uh, around 50 hectares so really huge uh, area it's also the world largest art nouveau uh, ensemble and uh, otto wagner the very famous art deco architect have uh, designed in 1907 uh, this uh, medical and therapeutic center with 55 terraced buildings for sanatoriums and nursing homes uh, with a totally floor, uh, uh, a cross floor area of 173,000 square meters. Uh, to have an idea about this area, I will show you a short video about this historic place. Here you see the church, the pavilions, the theater. Also a really nice garden area that's filled. And the entrance of this campus. Yeah, um, I think uh, you have now a good uh, idea about this area in the middle. You see, can see again this Art Nouveau uh, church from Otto Wagner and all the other buildings. Uh, most of the very famous universities are situated uh, in, camp in historic campus. And so now the Central European University from uh, US, uh, which was situated now in Budapest or in the past, will change to Vienna uh, and come to the Otto Wagner area. Uh, here on the right side, you see the map uh, from the part where the university will take place. Um, in the center, in the violet zone, uh, this is the core campus university part with the central axe with the office building the art nouveau theater and the kitchen uh, above uh, the otto wagner church and below on the right side uh, for pavilions for the university also for teaching uh, and also in the in the front the entrance buildings the red one uh, pavilions are uh, for the housing for students, as well as for professors. Uh, the left red part will be used then later also for other universities, which are not fixed yet. Uh, this part shall be ready retrofit in 2025. So we have not really much time to, to realize that. So what was our definition? Uh, Simon had told before, I will repeat uh, shortly, uh, the plus energy, it provides more primary energy uh, within the annual uh, energy balance than we will consume. The energy must be provided on site. So on the building, I will show you later and within the district and the totally energy consumption will be including the heating, cooling, lighting, ventilation, electric devices, and also the mobility on the uh, REI. Here you have a, a map uh, about all this area of 55 hectares with in summary uh, 63 uh, buildings, uh, 55 pavilions of them uh, from the Otto Wagner 
um, area in the historic uh, Art Nouveau style. On the left side, the, the blue pavilions are for the medical and rehab center, which will stay how it looks in the moment any longer there. And in the middle zone, um, you see uh, the, the pavilions for the Central European University, for the CU, and for other universities as well. Uh, in this middle axe, uh, the central building uh, is the Art Nouveau Theater. Um, it's one of the 10 largest uh, theater halls in, in Vienna. Uh, for 800 uh, auditoriums uh, have placed inside. And it will be also part of this core campus from the Central Uni European University. But the typical pavilions on this area are like this pavilion number 18. Uh, and we will take a look what we will um, uh, provide uh, for, for retrofitting uh, to plus energy standard. So very important is the insulation of the roof and the floor slabs, as well as the internal insulation of the external walls. Optimizing the box windows, so called in Austria, Kastenstock fenster, and the insulation of sun protection for against overheating. Minimizing the thermal breaches, optimizing the air tightness of these old buildings. Uh, highly efficient uh, ventilation systems for heat and moisture recovery. Um, highly efficient hot water preparation. Uh, as well as for the lighting system, and especially then to install on the roof the photovoltaic systems to generate energy. Uh, so for each pavilion, for the different functions, um, uh, we have uh, analyzed in our study all, all the parts, and I will show you some of the examples and results. Here you see a vertical cross section of uh, one pavilion with the external wall with the internal wall insulation uh, we prefer there uh, the carbon silicate boards uh, with between uh, 5 and 15 centimeter of thickness to realize a u value between uh, 0.28 and 0.35 uh, on the roof, uh, we prefer vacuum insulation. Uh, we know that the uh, most cost uh, intensive uh, variant, but on the other side, we can realize with a very thin insulation, a very well U value of 0 0.11, not destroying the very elegant uh, architecture from Otto Wagner. And I think that's very important. We also have to take care for all the heat breaches uh, that uh, we can re reduce that. Um, a very big potential of reduction we see uh, by the windows. Uh, we have here on the left side the original double frame windows or uh, box windows with a uh, U value from around uh, 2.5 watt per square meter and Kelvin and very on air tightness and uh, we prefer to change it to new double frame windows uh, which have the same design like the historic windows so normally you cannot see any difference but it has a dramatically better u value from below 0 0.7 watt per square meter and kelvin with triple glazing on the inside uh, and also i think very important that they are then very airtight as well, and have a much longer life uh, in, the, in the future than, than the old ones. So for the energy balance for such a plus energy campus, we have here in summary uh, four um, different uh, functions, the university, the housing function, then also that we have not here in, in, in this diagram, the medicine part with the reha center and then special functions. And here for this university and housing uh, examples, you see this 
dramatical reduction when you take care for all these parts like the heating, the domestic hot water, the cooling, uh, ventilation, lighting, community technologies for the kitchen, the elevators, and all the other electric consumptions, which you can reduce dramatically. So in summary, we bring down the energy demand by 82% for whole the area. Uh, but if we changed also the energy system from a district heating system, which exists uh, in the moment uh, with a very old system um, and which have to be uh, totally renewed uh, to a uh, geothermal energy infrastructure with heat pumps, uh, we can reduce the energy demand by uh, 91%. And so this demand can uh, protect totally by the photovoltaic on, on the roof, uh, which will produce in summary more than 5,000 gigawatt hours per year. Uh, how we uh, uh, prefer the uh, energy systems, the alternative one. Uh, on one side, uh, we prefer ring trench collectors in the deepness of two to three meter in the gardens in, in front of the pavilions if there are not too many trees. If there are too many trees and it's not possible to uh, place, then we prefer uh, board pile uh, heat pumps uh, in, in this traditional uh, way, you know. And in summary, all this energy will come for the heating, but also for all the other electric function and also for the mobility from the roof, uh, from where we can place uh, very well the photovoltaic systems. You see here by the example from the Pavilion 10, most of the pavilions uh, have uh, flat roofs. Um, so it's very easy to place it there. And that's also, um, Accord, accord it uh, with, with the Bundesdenkmalamt. So in, in summary, uh, this energy balance will show first, it's very important to, to reduce uh, the, dramatically the energy demand um, and it's up which uh, energy system or if district system, groundwater system or port pile or uh, system you, you will use can be um, produced then by, by PV uh, totally so that we come to a plus energy uh, district according to the Paris Agreement. Uh, when we take now a look to the investment cost and to the economic side, uh, first uh, we will take a look to the energy systems for the infrastructure. On the left side, you have the conventional system with a new heating and uh, cooling distri district heating and cooling system. On the right side, the alternative variant uh, with the ring range collectors, with the board piles, and with the PV, where you see it's much cheaper in, in summary when you have to install it new. When we take a look to the total investment cost, um, we have two parts, the non-energetic um, relevant costs. Uh, for that, we take not care uh, by, by our research study, study because we focused only uh, for the energetic relevant costs. And uh, here you see, uh, looking to the best version, uh, we have more costs from around uh, 355 euro per square meter um, for for the building uh, energy relevant costs, 41 euro per square meter for the um, energy system for, for heating cooling and uh, 38 euro per square meter for the PV system on the roof. So in summary, around 10% more cost against the minimal version. 
But uh, when you take now a look to the life cycle cost analysis over 40 years, um, you see in, in the first uh, slide uh, picture with only 30% reduction of energy uh, that the investment cost uh, smaller uh, that the plus energy investment costs, uh, but you have any longer uh, very high energy costs on the right uh, downstairs with the Otto Wagner Plus retrofit, the in, uh, extra investment cost for this very well retrofit, uh, let's say very high, but the energy bill each year in the future are nearby nothing. So in summary, you can see that from the first day on, it's the cheapest way you can do. And that without any subsidy, <laughs> how, uh, how we have calculated. Uh, we have calculated uh, this runtime from the bank lo loan over 15 years. So after this 15 years, uh, there are only the, the energy bill, the yearly one. But uh, plus uh, that analyzes the Central European University, which were also part in our research project, have done the world's first calculation also for the co-benefits for such a retrofit. And that was really very interesting. So besides the energetic relevant investments, besides the energy costs, they calculate also the PV earnings uh, they will get uh, from this uh, electric, which will not uh, used themselves um, when it was produced. Also uh, the costs for the energy system resilience, but then, uh, and that was really worldwide the first time they calculated also and analyzed the productivity benefits like the health impacts, um, the mental uh, well-being, the active days. So when you don't be ill, uh, the work floor force uh, productivity. And um, the di diagram shows that after 15 years, so that the red uh, uh, columns uh, sh show the time when, when uh, all the investments for these retrofits were uh, paid back. And by four, 40 years, then uh, you see normally the, the upcoming costs from, from the energy bill and also when, when the people are not so product, productivity, uh, while uh, by the Otto Wagner Plus retrofit, the costs after, 50, after 40 years are lower or, or on the same level like after 15 years. So in summary, uh, we see uh, that uh, this really famous uh, retrofit uh, is possible to bring this historic area to a net zero carbon campus and uh, to a plus energy campus. And as well for the city of Vienna, for Austria and for the Central European University, it's a really historic milestone to show the world how I always tell you, everything is possible. You only have to do it. And in this way, our consortium, finally, I want to show you uh, for this research uh, study, uh, Schuvel Pearl were the lead, uh, the building physics, the uh, Vienna University of Technology, the Center University or European University, CCU were part the URT student housing and we from Blank Consulting and by the Green Building Summer School last year, this project were also part and also by this next summer school. So thank you for your attention and um, see you by the discussion. Thank you, Günther. I think Dominic will give us a short um, input to Slido, if he's there, maybe not. Okay, 
Anyway, thank you, both of you. Um, I think that was very interesting to see both sides, one of the more the new forward-looking sort of energy positive districts and what it means in terms of energy efficiency and general CO2 emissions. And the other thing, looking back onto the historic sites and the sites that we need to. I mm. briefly think I hand over to Dominic um, for he will say a few words um, how we proceed um, with the with the question yes exactly so thanks to everyone for the for the input so far actually we got a lot of questions already on slido so at least a few people found it so i just like to remind you um you can go uh you have chat you have the polls people and then slido and this is where you can ask the questions um i've seen uh, a lot of people also uh requesting to share uh the video and audio uh so from now on uh, we will accept uh if you want to come on camera and ask your question uh you can just ask to share your video and audio but only if you have a question for our speakers so the other the other questions we're going to take uh from the q a uh directly from slido so i will share this screen right now so we all can see what are the questions the most popular ones there's 17 questions so far so uh, doris will navigate uh, those and i will mark them as answered as we go um and if you want to come on camera like i said uh, feel free and uh, we can ask questions like this thank you okay thank you dominic for introducing us to all these new tools so first of all I think I want to start with the first question that I think was pressing, maybe just a one sentence answer. How fast are things moving? When are plus energy districts state of the art? And maybe this is um, geared towards Dominic. Maybe we can ask one of these questionnaires that we had at the beginning to see what all the um, other participants think of one. When do um, energy positive buildings become state of the art in the future. What do we think? Is it 10 years? Is it 15 years? Is it 50 years? But first, I would like to address this to our two speakers. So, Simon, one um, sentence answer. When is it state of the art? <clears throat> well, it should be state of the art as of this year because the European Union already legislatively said that we are supposed to. The standard is net zero energy buildings, right? That's the standard. We're supposed to have this already, but since every country is interpreting this uh, very, not so ambitiously, I would say, um, it probably takes much longer. Now it's difficult to estimate obviously, but it, we should have them already today. So that's my one sentence answer to this. <laughs> Günther? Yeah. I, what do you think? I think when when do we start building only energy positive buildings and districts yeah as simon has said uh, do you agree with simon is it now uh, is it already happening uh, absolutely uh, it has to be work from today on everywhere worldwide but if we see the discussion on the other side the daily discussion i'm sure it's not in 100 years uh, so far uh, so we have really forced all the requirements uh, really to do it, that we have no longer any discussion about this, so that it's really normal to do it and that it's abnormal if it doesn't do it. Okay. Follow up question to Simon as well and to Günther, and then I come back to all the questions that you guys have put up in Slido already. Um, Simon, what's the in your in your point of view? What's the biggest barrier at the moment um, that energy positive districts are not more widely implemented in terms of technical, um, economical, social, whatever? What do you think? Well, in in my in my as I see it, is is mostly a problem of the lacking legal requirements. Uh, we could have uh, much more implementation if it was just um, legally required. And I think um, we don't have enough demonstration projects that show that it's actually possible for um, the legislative push to, to be brave enough to actually want that. 
Okay. So the framework conditions, not technical, yeah. but um, uh, other framework conditions like legal, political. Okay. Um, Günther, what is your view on that? Uh, I do you agree? I, I, I think uh, that the main problems are that, they, that uh, every one of us is uh, in his daily work totally uh, full uh, with everything and have no time to think about uh, to, to, to make it more innovative. Um, and 99% of the people in the process are never looked to, to innovative projects or, or research projects, I, I think uh, they only do that what they do uh, the last 100 years. And so this mm. break, it's very important uh, to, to, to realize uh, that, that it becomes normal. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, thanks for that. Um, for the quick answers. I would like to move now to the top questions that we have to receive from our participants. And again, the invite to everybody who is listening um, in now, if you want to share your screen, if you want to ask a question directly, please, please do so. Um, and otherwise, I will just take the questions from what you have posted in Slido. So first questions, I think we've already done that. We will look at the questionnaire later on to see how you have voted 10, 20, 30 or even more years. So the second most like question is um, what's currently the best um, practice examples? Again, I'm asking to my two panelists, what do you think? Is it in Vienna? I mean, can we boast about this? Can we say, well, really we have it here or is it elsewhere? Oh, that's, that's of course, that's a very good question. I think it was already before, <laughs> before the talk even started and I already saw that and I was like, yeah, that's, that's because it addresses the main problem, I think, which is uh, what are we supposed to aim at, right? I mean, we're, we're currently trying to push with these positive energy districts. We're trying to be as good as possible, as efficient as possible, as much as possible, 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 possible. But uh, on the other hand, we know what is necessary um, in terms of our climate goals, and we don't know how this two come together. We know uh, we are supposed to be energy, um, neutral, uh, carbon neutral by 2040, but we don't know how big a part of the building sector needs to be reduced. We don't know, is it, is it 40%, is it 60%, is it 80%? And if we don't know that, what the target of the individual district, uh, of the individual building sector is, then how are we supposed to know um, what is the goal for each and every district? And, and, and then the question is, Every district is different, and we don't. We, we have to have targets that address the differences of the different buildings. Like uh, the Otto Wagner areal, um, the possibilities are completely different than if you build something on the uh, completely new, right? So this needs to be addressed in some in some way as well, because otherwise we'll just do as as much as we can. And as Günther said, well, it's often not as much as we would hope to, um, and and then it's difficult. But what I want to say. Um, apart from this uh, the rent, this, this, this theoretical or this rent in general, is uh, in, in, in Vienna we have these first uh, examples, um, because I know Vienna the best, uh, with, uh, in, in the Mühlgrundgasse, where they actually already include renewable um, wind peak shaving, so that they already um, heat the building when the wind power is available and would otherwise not even be into the grid because they would have to pay penalty. So there they have a system where they already have so much flexibility that they can incorporate more renewables into the system mm -hmm. and then would otherwise be possible. And I think that's the most important part right now. Yeah. So maybe we shouldn't name it energy positive district, maybe we should name it energy flexible district because of the storage capacity. So that's a sort of, again, naming mm. issue. Günther, what do, you, what do you think? Do I get an example? Do I get a name from you in terms of what is the world's best energy positive uh, district? I think it's hard to, to, to say because uh, in, in the moment so many things happened around the world. When I seen the last weeks uh, by the happy hour in, in America, what, what happened there in, 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 in Toronto, in, in New York, uh, uh, in, in Vancouver, uh, on the other side, two years ago in, in, in China, where a whole city district were built uh, in the standard, hopefully it's a plus energy district, I, I, I cannot say 
very detailed uh, how how the quality is finally. Uh, but I think uh, they are really done very good jobs. Uh, but also in Germany, in Austria, and, and mm -hmm. elsewhere. I think in the moment, uh, everyone on the world, uh, everywhere on the on the world, it, it starts with, with, with these fields, which will be the best. It, it's hard to say. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to follow up on a maybe a question that is kind of leading to that because Simon, you were already talking about what are we aiming for, what are the targets. One of the questions was also regarding the system, uh, uh, the system boundaries, so to speak, because the question is, um, what is really the, the optimal size of an energy positive district? I mean, it has a lot to do with that. We want to name mm -hmm. things and we want to define things. So do you think that we have a definite size where we can say, yes, I mean, it is, I don't know, uh, 300 flats and 10,000 square mm -hmm. meters, or is there a size? Or do we just leave it as it is and say we're in for the best? <laughs> yeah, um, it's a good question. I think it's, it's um, as we have it right now, a, a number of buildings with different usages is the unofficial definition right now. And I think that's useful because it incorporates the different usages and the synergies that you can have with different usages and the synergies that you can have from different buildings and having a larger aggregation scale that you can optimize for. I think that is useful and this is a step up from having just a building uh, scope to having a district scope I think is useful. But again, it's um, we also need the same for cities and regions. Obviously, um, if we want to connect the goals of a district, we need to connect it to the goals of the city and the goals of the city itself needs to be connected to the goal of the country and ultimately to our Paris goals, right? So I think it's, a, it's good to have a district scale with um, a number of buildings that doesn't need to be further defined actually. But we need also this definition boundaries that are uh, larger than that, I think, uh, on the city scale, yeah. Okay. I think the answer is very yeah. simple. So uh, the right uh, region or the, or the district have to be the whole planet, uh, because we have only one planet. In the moment, we use three of the planets in minimum. Uh, and so mm -hmm. it has to make work everywhere around the world. We have, we, we cannot change to the mass. Yeah like yesterday, <laughs> so yeah, to eat. That's true. That's true. So maybe um, a, a question again, uh, leading to this, um, there was one question, can we even, uh, do we even manage with the renewable energy resources? I'm going to maybe I start with you there because you were talking about an existing building and also the importance of um, converting our existing building stock into energy positive buildings and districts. So the question is there, do, do we think that um, we have enough space? Let's just focus on the buildings now, or so on the, on, the, on the built environment as such. Will we have enough space for the renewable energy in order to cover our energy um, needs? Yes and no. Uh, if you don't reduce the energy demand uh, first, Good answer. Uh, then we have not enough uh, space for the renewable energy. If you take care to reduce all possibilities of reduction, uh, then uh, the, the, the final demand will be so small that you have everywhere by each building enough space. Uh. So reduce yes. before you generate. That's the key, that's the key point. But uh, okay. I just want to add one thing that is always interesting for me in this discussion, because this is always the question of increasing efficiency, right? Um, and and the big pitfall there is always the rebound effect of um, if we are more efficient with our energy use, it's getting more, um, it's, it's more cheap and therefore we use it more. And this trend we have seen for the last 200 years, right? So uh, the one big, and for me, always the biggest question is this, uh, dimension of sufficiency. How do we actually, if it's more efficient, how do we actually use it less, even though it would be very cheap to use more, right? The the, the question, like uh, the same question with, we have cars that go faster and we can go further, but how do we actually uh, change our systems and our thinking in that way that, that we don't actually need to do it and shouldn't do it, even though it's possible? 
like the, the same with the, the indoor temperature, right? The 20 degrees uh, indoor temperature was the standard in Austria, and now it's 22 degrees because the buildings are so much more efficient and uh, it doesn't cost anything to, to heat them even more. But in, in the long run, it's uh, counterproductive. And yeah. yeah. So I think sufficiency, that's a, that's a key topic because when you think about it in the East, we had a four person family was living maybe on 60 square meters mm -hmm. and would double the energy use that we have now. And now we need double the square meter for the same size family. So we need more space. Um, maybe we have reduced our energy demand, but the space has doubled. So at the end of the day, that's exactly what you were talking about. It's also the sort of mm -hmm. re rebound. But let me focus on one of the more questions that is coming up. Maybe, Simon, we follow up with you since you're focusing on a new development that's just being built now. Maybe you can talk from experience there. And I think that's a very important question is what are the financing models in Europe? So who's actually going to pay for that? Um, is it the building owner? Is it the developer? Is it the building user at the end of the day? So what are the models that um, you're working on now? Uh, on the developments that you're working on now, now that you consider appropriate and how could it be translated to capitalist usa i'm reading that yeah uh that that, that is uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that i think is, is, is the is the crucial the the, the, the crucial question. question yes because right now there's often systems where you have the investors um trying to build as cheaply as possible just because they want to sell it with the highest margin and there is no interest in having a good quality product right so that's the basic problem that um, the one that is producing the product, um, the market is not in a certain, the, the consumer of the product being the person who buys the, the home or the office space or rents it, um, it has a lot of different um, considerations apart from energy and efficiency and, and re emissions. So the, the consciousness is only part of the story and it's increasing, but, but nevertheless, uh, the business cases are not there yet. So the, the one way um, that is being shifting right now is that the utilities companies that have traditionally supplied the energy now find themselves in a competing market because um, you have different ways of actually, um, they call it energy communities, where you have um, a combination of different um, buildings or different um, solar generation owners that can pool their electricity together and can share it when it is um, appropriate for them. And that makes it easier for them to use the electricity and, and more cost effective. Problem being, of course, that this is a relatively new technique and you need someone to operate this kind of system. And the classical utility companies, they, they don't really see this as their primary energy, uh, their primary uh, business model. So right now there is a void of of mm. of a gap in the market i would say of operation um of these renewable decentralized um energy communities and uh this has to do with of course the building is more complicated um you need smart meters and and um, other sensors to measure what energy is actually flowing in which direction but uh, as soon as you solve this problem um, I think um, there will be a big boost in these kinds of kinds of systems. Right now in Austria, um, there's still some legal uncertainties as to how and when it's possible, but the legal foundations have been set for individual um, producers, the so-called prosumers. They're not consumers, but they're prosumers. They're producing and consuming at the same time. And mm -hmm. if the, her, the, the burden is lowered of uh, administrative overhaul uh, over... Uh, how do you say the all the different kinds of ad, uh, administering overhead exactly thank you overhead. um when that is more standardized and you have um companies um providing that um then i think those systems will will get more widely used okay so it needs to make sense economically as well. So again, when we talk about sustainability, we always say social, environmental, but also economical sustainability. So otherwise, I guess it's not going to work. 
So I'm asking Günther has working a lot, has been working a lot in passive house technology, and you had, I think, to deal with a lot of this typical investor owner or investor user um, uh, conflict. So the investor invests in, let's say, a passive house or a plus energy building, but actually the user has the benefits. And the investor, you know, maybe he has sold his uh, building more efficiently or maybe with more money, but at the end of the day, if he's just renting it, people are not necessarily paying more rent for this. So how do you think this translates from what has been happening in a sort of the passive house domain towards this sort of plus energy buildings where people need to invest something, but those are not necessarily the, day, the same people who will be benefiting from this yes, investment? Uh, I think that uh, you're right uh, that this is a, a big point uh, which have to be regulated uh, uh, very soon we discuss about this problem since 15 years in, in Austria and I think also in, in the other parts in the world. Um, but on the other side, uh, by each project where we make detailed calculations, uh, like by this project, we, we always wondering ourselves how uh, economic uh, these retrofits will be for both sides and that uh, it's it, it, it's a crazy time to take time to discuss about this because if you discuss two years about this if it makes sense or not uh, this more costs are higher than to do it only <laughs> so be more mm. ambitious okay uh, but it's still and something do don't, don't discuss uh, yeah. <laughs> about that <laughs> that's my tip <laughs> Very good. Okay, um, I would like to invite um, people to really join us. I see that there have been two people joining us um, in the moderation panel. I'm not sure if those um, want to say something I think, online um, yeah. or if let's try just, it. Let's um, try it. Joined by yeah. accident. Let's try. If not, then yeah. Okay. So I have two people actually, um, Mark Auerbach and Katharina Böhler, who joined in the moderation panel. So if you want to ask a question directly online, then please do so now. Otherwise, so I have added Mark in Slido. Okay, Mark, Mark oh, didn't have a question, but Katharina, <laughs> Katharina had many questions actually uh, in the chat. So let's bring her on. Let's see. So she should be able to share and join us on the panel to ask her question if she accepts or maybe she okay. didn't have a, a live question either. Okay. We have someone else joining. Let's see. Okay. Then let's. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Hi. Okay, Hi. Now somebody's Thank you. Hello and uh, welcome. Congratulations welcome. for a uh, first very first lively slide, yes. and professional uh, presentation. And I've seen that a lot of people uh, from Kosovo have been listening to you as well. Uh, I have a question for any of you. Um, uh, actually, I'm a PhD student in uh, University of Zagreb. I just started uh, this year and would uh, like to work on a topic to merge urban planning and energy efficiency. So I, I wanted to ask if you have any uh, examples of positive energy districts in developing countries, if you know of that I, I could relate and, and, and uh, research as we depend 87% of uh, carbon, I mean on fuel, uh, uh, coal energy. So it's, it, it's a very 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 drastic transition to propose okay. so just if you can think of a, a positive energy district or positive let's say neighborhood small neighborhood in developing countries to see as an example thank you thank you Sadir. Mm. okay thank you very much and thank you very much for coming online it's always nice to share this directly so i hand over the questions to simon and Tuna. um Again, a question for a director. Yeah, I'm thinking, unfortunately, I mean, it's a very good question. I, I don't, doesn't any, does anything come to mind? The only thing is um, in the Emirates or was it in Dubai where they had one city where they wanted to have um, um, positive energy district. 
Uh, I don't remember the name though. But other than that, uh, Master City. You mean Master yes. City? But Master I mean, City? that is of course a very special case and I don't think that's, yeah, that's not really a little bit different. <laughs> yeah. Other than that, I don't know, Günther, no. do you have any example? No. With a lot of <laughs> not, not really yet. <laughs> But maybe I think uh, maybe to, to, to give you um, um, some support in this, I think it doesn't always need to be an example that is really from a developing country. And it's sometimes taking the ideas and not just and translating them into mm. another country, you know, with a different climate and everything. So it doesn't need to be one a one to one copy of what is um, being developed here in because, again, we have a different climate, we have different fra framework conditions and so on. But maybe we can take you can take some of the ideas that are um, that you take from the energy positive districts around Europe and translate some of the ideas into into other countries as well. But I would like to ask um, another, I mean, there are two more people, Anna Lindorfer, Jürgen Bauer, if one of you wants to come online since you have joined our moderation. Um, one again has been scared by me naming the name. Jürgen Bauer is still online. Do you want to come and ask a question? Otherwise, I will go back to the Slido question. We still have a few more minutes. Yes. Hello. Anna I'm Lindor. sorry. Very I welcome. think my internet connection is really bad. <laughs> so I got Hello kicked and out. welcome. Um, thank you. No uh, thank you for the presentation. It was really you. interesting. Um, and um, I'm currently also with Simon working on a project which is called Cities for Pets, um, where we um, screen and um, think about the definition of pets across Europe. So maybe the question which was asked before, there is a booklet on positive energy districts from JPI, um, which is for European projects, but maybe um, you can find a project which fits um, for your um, investigation there. Um, just this as an information, mm -hmm. I just thought about it. Um, okay. but I actually have a question um, concerning yeah. the Otto Areal, um, because what I what I, what was what would be interesting for me was the question: as you're retrofitting so many historical and protected buildings, um, you would need very um, specialized construction companies, which probably are not on the market yet in Vienna. Um, and so I was wondered what is the strategy to get those specialized companies on board um, and to build so much expertise and capacity within the five years. Okay. Yeah, Thank you very uh, much. I think that's Anna, you were right. Uh, that's really not easy, uh, but I, I think how it works in the past. Uh, if we are to do um, serious for, for this and, and, and wait, if, if someone is coming themselves, then then it's never will happen. So we have to start with that and uh, uh, make a clear criteria for, for the um, uh, offers. And, and then I think it, it, it will work. Uh, it's necessary to have a good control system on, on the building side all, all the time. And also to, uh, to, uh, that, that the companies have to show uh, that they have expertise on these fields. Um, yeah, finally, I'm sure we, we will reach the goals. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, expertise also in terms of not just planning expertise, but also the, the, the skills in order to build this, so the craftsmanship. Um, but, Günther, uh, you showed the windows one, and everything, one, one point, so that's not, uh, not an easy task. I can task. say more. Uh, so thank you for the question. For that, we we, we think, have training yeah, courses, sorry. Uh, hundreds of them, uh, only in Austria, and I think the same uh, worldwide. Uh, but. Uh, less of them really were used. So I think as long it is not a requirement to do it in this way in general, uh, not enough companies uh, and, and workers will, will use it. Uh, okay. 
So the skills, the, the building, building up of the skills is one of the key aspects mm -hmm. here as well. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you for those online who dare to come online. Um, I think that makes the discussion even more lively. I would like um, to slowly close now because we're coming to the end of our panel discussions. And I would like to ask both panelists um, to give a closing statement. And I have one last question that I have from the slide, or maybe you can integrate this somehow or add this to your closing statement. And that is the, what we all also talk a lot about is the greening of the buildings. So how to introduce also uh, uh, green facades, green roofs, et cetera. In the, how does this conflict um, when we at the same time want to use the facades and the roofs for renewable energy, namely for PV? So that's um, really my last question here that I want to take from Slido. And I would like um, to start maybe with you, Gunther, to follow up on this and uh, just give us maybe a quick answer to the question and then uh, in, in a closing, general, uh, um, green a roofs and statement. PV can work well together. Uh, that uh, is a result of newest uh, research and uh, also done by some examples now, especially for the Otto Wagner area, I think. Uh, that may be only for some special uh, parts of the roofs, but not in general, because this area is a very green area. Uh, so that's and and on the other side, we we, we have the problems with the design, <laughs> historic design uh, in in the Art Nouveau style from Otto Wagner, and that bring the problem that we have then to a sick construction in summary if we will do both because then we have also to make a distance between the green roof and the pv and that is then not allowed so uh, therefore yeah yeah um so in in, in general of course, yeah so it's more difficult i want to say a okay big thank you to the Short organization closing statement. Uh, to everyone to the gps um which done a great and amazing work. Um, I'm really wondering how many uh, people from around the world, and I see many of my friends uh, were listening uh, by this first session. Um, and <laughs> we, we, I hope we have shown with this uh, uh, study that uh, we reduce the energy demand by 90 percent is not only possible by new buildings and and by buildings from the 60s and 70s it's by all the buildings possible it's only a question if you don't think you if you think you can do it and then you have to do it uh, and then it's really easy that all all the buildings can be positive energy buildings themselves and positive districts and a positive world and finally a positive future for the for our children so thank you and in this way we have to work and uh, especially the central european university uh, will be happy when in four years they will change to the otto wagner area that every one of you from all the world will come and study there and see in lifetime how it works thank you okay thanks Günther, for this positive ending note um, um simon yes short answer yes uh the green roofs i mean there is some um uh, that's a short answer. Yeah, this is not my forte. But yeah, um, so there is a, a brochure of uh, the city of Vienna, actually, solar green roofs. They show a couple of possibilities how to include greenery and PV because the greenery sometimes is even beneficial because it provides um, uh, it, uh, cooling from humidification and the, the cooler the PV gets, the more it produces electricity. So there's even some synergy there. Um, that is currently being explored right now. But um, in general, as my uh, closing statement, yeah, I, I would think okay. technologically, right, there is a lot of possibilities already today. And the question remains, um, how can this be implemented in usable business models? Like, for example, if we have a carbon tax, a lot of the things that we're show today will be much easier developed very, very, mm. very quickly. And the same with the carbon tax, 
the, the principal question is not so much a question of technology, but it's a question of effort sharing. Who is who is having which burden in this decarbonization and who is having to having to pay this? So this is ultimately a political discussion, obviously, but um, it's technologically, I think, very doable. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you to both of you. I think you have both ended on a very positive note. So I think we can say um, from a technological perspective, we're already there. We can do actually more. And I think what's really nice, what I really liked on all the questions that the audience and all the participants have posted, and it was really a good mix of sort of technical questions and social or socioeconomic questions, and those that relate to the business model and to the actual implementation. So I think that shows a great awareness of also of all the participants, what are the, the barriers and what lies ahead of us when we actually want to implement more energy positive buildings.